So welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us in our webinar, Gender Inclusive and Trans Affirming Language Pedagogy. From CLET, we're very happy to bring you new professional development opportunities. Now I will give the floor to Tyler. Hi, and welcome to our talk this evening on Gender Inclusive and Trans Affirming Language Pedagogy, the Student Perspective. My name is Tyler William Johnson and I'm the Ed Tech Specialist and <clears throat> World Language Consultant at CLET World Languages. I've now worked at CLUT for over a year and would be more than thrilled to talk to you about our materials on another day. However, my background is in German language acquisition and I've taught at the beginning and intermediate levels for the past seven years, as well as I've explored the topic of gender throughout my own, re throughout my own degrees. So therefore, I'm excited to be the host of tonight's webinar as it's something that I've struggled with in my own world language classroom as a German teacher, but also because I am part of the community represented within these conversations. We all explore with our identity expression through which can be with gender inclusive and trans affirming language within the world language classroom. I also attended the talk tonight at ACFL in 2022, so therefore I'm pleased to introduce to you Lindsay Perso, who is the Assistant Professor of German Studies in the Department of World Languages and Culture at Iowa State University. She holds her degree in Germanic Linguistics in the University of California, Berkeley. Her research lies at the intersection of sociolinguistics, applied linguistics, and language pedagogy, bringing qualitative and quantitative research on the social dimensions of language into dialogue with the ways language is taught and legislated. And also, I'm pleased to introduce to you Nico Traxdorf, who is an ass assistant professor of German and the co-director of German International Engineering Program at University of Rhode Island. His research teaching focus and teaching focuses on interdisciplinary language teaching, diversity and inclusion, and intercultural competence. In 2020, Nico Traxdorf received the Nelson Brooks Award for Excellence in the Teaching of Culture from the American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Languages. He is the editor and co-author of Klutz Impulse Deutsch textbook series. So enough about me and more about gender inclusive and trans affirming language pedagogy, the student perspective. I present to you, Lindsay and Nico. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tyler, for the nice introduction. And also thanks to Clad World Languages for organizing this webinar. And thanks to everyone in the audience, all the attendees um, for, for joining us tonight in the evening. I see more and more people coming in. It's great to see um, how many are attending because that really shows how important this topic is. And we really appreciate that you were carving out time to be here because we know all our lives are very, very busy. Um, we look very much forward to sharing, but also, of course, to the Q&A at the end to also learn a little bit about what you are doing and what questions you may have. But before we get started, um, we would like to know what languages you are teaching. Um, so if you could either put in this code on menti.com or use the QR code and then post your language that you're speaking so we can have a nice word cloud uh, in a minute or two. So if you can see the screen, I see some of you also sharing in the chat, but also if you can see the screen, you can scan the QR code, you can put the address in your browser, menti.com, and put in the code 29891609. And I'm just gonna wait another 20 seconds for you to do that, and then we can see what the results are. And yes, I can put the code up again. I saw that in the chat and that someone asked for the code again. So here's the code of the QR code, as well as the, the numbers for menti.com. Okay, thank you so much. We see a lot of languages and I also see all the hellos from the chat. 
hello back. And many of you also wrote where you're from. I see a lot of representation from all different states. Um, that's that's great to, as well. Um, so while this is still developing and more and more uh, adding their languages, and we can get back to that at the end as well to see if anything changed. Um, in terms of the languages, I see a lot of German and Deutsch, also French and Spanish, very prominent here in the room. Also Chinese, Portuguese, Italian, Korean. We have just a lot of languages, Japanese. Um, that's great. So what are we going to do today and what are you going to see? First of all, we're going to introduce you to the concept and give you some background knowledge. Then we will share some examples from a German textbook, Impuls Deutsch, where we talk about how we include um, gender inclusive language. But of course, that's applicable to other contexts and you can then think about how you can translate that into your language and, and your approaches. Um, then we're going to talk about data and study, student perspectives. Um, we collected data and wanted to know what do our students actually think about these topics? How do they perceive it? And how much they can they actually do after learning about it? Um, and then we're going to share some best, best practices and we will focus on French, German, as well as Spanish. But again, you are very surely able to apply this to the other languages as well, since many of these tips are very universal. So I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay, who's going to talk about the concept itself. Great. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, you can flip to the next slide, actually. Um, <clears throat> what we're talking about today um, and what is in the title of this talk um, is the term gender inclusive language. And when people think about gender inclusive language, I think they probably think about much different things today than they might have 10 years ago, right? I think today when we see this, automatically people are thinking pronouns. Um, I think those of us who were teaching 10 years ago at the time were thinking um, very specifically in languages like German or Spanish about those nouns that denote professions, right, that either have to come in a masculine form or a feminine form. When we're using the term gender inclusive language today, we're talking really broadly, we're really interested in that whole spectrum of languages, of languaging, of terminology, be it nouns, and their and their you know and their and their connected classes of speech pronouns, adjectives, etc., um, um, or or more generally forms of languaging that allow speakers to represent gendered positionalities both within and beyond the binary. So the representation of masculine and feminine, as well as other positionalities, um, and the inclusion of trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming, which is often referred to. The acronym TGNC that you'll see today in this presentation um, as well. You can flip to the next slide, Nico. Thanks. So, a little bit about though, I'd like to focus back right now on a big subcategory of gender inclusive language, which is the issue of grammatical gender. And it is those nouns, those pronouns, those words in 43% of languages that get classified into groupings based on what we call in European languages, grammatical gender. The linguistic fact is that gender has nothing to do with these things, which language scientists call noun classes. Noun classes are manners of classifying nouns into different groupings that change the way they behave grammatically in the language. And this helps us track a noun over a long period of discourse, right, to see, oh, that noun matches with this pronoun, and I can tell because they're both marked the same way. In German, we might say they're both feminine, but in some languages of Africa, you might say, oh, they're both nouns that refer to animals, and those are a whole class in and of themselves, right? So noun class is actually a very common thing in the world's languages. There's a famous Mark Twain essay, The Awful German Language. It really exoticizes this. It's, oh, German's so difficult because it's got these three, you know, these three, these three genders. This is actually quite normal. And so the framing of it as a problem that, oh, this makes things difficult is kind of funny because this is something that all, you know, languages grapple with on some level. And 43% of languages um, have some have some significant, um, significant uh, involvement with. The fact that we call gender grammatical gender is an accidental artifact of the beginnings of linguistics and philology with European languages, where in many European languages, gender is one of many things that might determine the class of a noun, right? So in German, der Mann, the man, die Frau, the woman, 
masculine, feminine, but what's a table? A table's masculine. Why is a table masculine? Because in German, monosyllabic nouns, nouns that are just one syllable, tend to often be masculine. So in German, as in many languages, it's a really complex algorithm that we can't even get computers to replicate of the interaction of different features of a noun that classify it into different classes. Gender assignment is typically arbitrary and conditioned by phonology and morphology, so the sounds of the words and the way they work grammatically, um, with really the rare exception of these animate nouns that actually refer to people, right? So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about when we're saying what is grammatical gender. You can flip to the next slide, Nico. So, Looking at those rare exceptions where this becomes something that does involve itself with the social construct of gender, we're looking at different kinds of things, right? English does have remnants of its old grammatical gender system still in the language. And we see this, um, and we see this discussed um, in, in, you know, um, discourse about gender inclusive language, often again with those profession words, right? So. If you've got salesmen and saleswomen, and you want to refer to a group, a mixed gender group of women and men, you've got some options. You can say salesmen and saleswomen. Feminists for decades have been saying, well, why not saleswomen and salesmen, right? There's different ways of kind of representing the binary in different ways. Um, but the gender inclusive option there would be salespeople. Right. And of course, it's not that easy because this works for this term, but it doesn't work so well for, let's say, actress and actor. Right. So even in English, where we don't have, by most people's definition, a noun class system or grammatical gender, this is, you know, something that we're grappling with. And of course, as those of you, most of you who I saw from the um, from the response to the poll know in languages like Spanish and French, and German, this is not something that just affects individual nouns, but also indefinite pronouns, articles, nouns, adjectives, anything that you have to mark the same way that you're marking a noun. But the solutions still overlap, right? So if you take something in Spanish, like the word for everybody that comes in todos and todas, a masculine and feminine form, and you want to be again referring to that mixed group, you can pair them. You can front the feminine, um, but that's still binary, right? And so there's new options emerging, such as an E as the gender marker that are meant to refer to a spectrum of positionalities. When you look at this French example on the bottom, of course, it's complicated in Spanish too, all kinds of problems, but the, you know, the French example here, um, again, you've got these professions, engineer marked for masculine, or feminine. And again, there are a plethora of different options emerging for how we might express this in a way that represents multiple gender positionalities. One of them is to use this median point and then in the E so that it isn't identical with the feminine, right? Un point A. Great, we've solved it for our uh, indefinite article, un, but what about the definite article? Doesn't help, right? So. There's so many overlapping solutions and so many quote unquote problems, if we're going to frame it that way, um, that I think that's why we're presenting this for not just German, but for all languages, because kind of bringing these all into, into conversation with each other shows you that this is not an issue that is specific to any particular language. Let me go next slide. In German, you're seeing a lot of interesting, um, interesting platforms emerge that kind of show you visually um, and based on data, uh, the different kinds of ways that people are inventing, coming back to gender inclusive ways, um, but gender inclusive ways of, of languaging. Um, this uh, this um, screenshot is from Genderator, Genderator. It's an app um, where you can look up, for example, any um, noun referring to a profession and see some different kinds of ways that people are choosing um, to kind of make that um, make that problem um, <clears throat> something that we can um, we can handle. So you see, on one hand, in the first column, 
the kind of strategy being used. So in the first one, it says pair form, right? That one where you just use the masculine and the feminine, leaving out any other options. You've got the schräg strich form is the is a form where you've got a um, one of those uh, dashes, and then you've got all these other forms. And then on the far end, you have what's really interesting, which is the degree of realization in the corpus that they're using. How often are you actually seeing this form being used? So you have kind of a way of seeing both the efficacy of it and whether people are actually using it. Nico, you can flip to the next. Thanks. So kind of in summary, what you need to understand about grammatical gender, noun classes, and gender-inclusive language to understand um, what Nico has done in Impulse Deutsch is first that languages with grammatical gender have non-identical but overlapping barriers tool and tools, tools for the expression of diverse gender positionalities. Clearly, there are some areas of German where you don't find the same problems that you do for French and vice versa. Um, but the strategies that are emerging, you know, that E in Spanish and French, the um, median point in French and the asterisks in German, they're all kind of in conversation with each other. This is not a thing that's happening in one language in isolation, um, but it's kind of solutions that are emerging on a larger level. So likewise, languages with grammatical gender also have non-identical but overlapping tools for the expression of diverse positionalities. And finally, you know, um, I think that I think Nico somehow we've repeated the same the same summary three times. <laughs> but I think the final thing to understand um, is that um, this is not an exotic problem or a strange problem. This is a, this is a problem if we're going to view it that way again that. 43% of the languages of the world have on a deep level, and English isn't even included in that, right? And so looking to other languages and looking outside what we're doing in our own classrooms to the discourses circulating about this in various arenas is interesting. Nico? Okay, sorry for the mix up on the slides. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, I'm going to dive into one example now, and that is the textbook Impulse Deutsch from Cladwell Languages. Um, these examples will be from German, but I will really try to explain it so that um, all of those who do not speak the language understand um, how we approach it. And hopefully we will then be able to apply it to the language that you are teaching as well. Um, before I start talking about Impulse Deutsch, I would like to point out that I'm, of course, talking about it today as one person, but I'm really representing a big team of the core team, offers, guest offers, consultants, because one of the most important things when writing the book was to get as many voices represented as we could be. Um, we are all not experts of every, everything. We all make mistakes and we learn in interaction with each other and seeing other perspectives. So um, here you see the core team of authors, um, also our guest authors who really helped shape uh, what the, the book is today, including Lindsay, and that you see on the slide as well, one of our guest authors. Um, and then as well as our consultants as well that helped uh, again um, bring new perspectives in it as well. So before I dive into um, gender inclusive language, I would like to tell you a little bit about the concept of the book itself so that you can see how that fits in. Um, the major questions that we asked ourselves as authors and guest authors and also the consultants who contributed is, who are the learners in our class? Who are they? And that started in the beginning with an interdisciplinary perspective on teaching thinking about what are the goals of our students in our class? Do they take the language to go abroad and just travel? Do they want to read or analyze literature? Do they want to work in a global company? Uh, are they interested in music theory that is written in a language they don't yet understand? Or are they just engineers who really like cars, right? And so they choose German. So they're just very different reasons to choose a language. And I'm sure you can think of several for your language as well. Um, but in addition to that, it was also the question of the intersectional identities of our students, their personal interests, their stories, what are they interested in, and what part of groups are they from, and how are we representing that with the materials that, that we give them to learn a language, which inherently ask students to share about, you know, their worldviews and perspectives as well. Um, 
And then at the same time, what language are we teaching? Which parts and aspects of the language are we teaching? Who are we including or not including in terms of the materials we're providing to the students? And what kind of representation do we have in terms of the speakers of the language and the stories that we're sharing? So this is kind of the background and hope you see how that fits in with the, with the question of um, gender inclusive language. Uh, and one more thing I want to preface because it uh, will come up um, during, during the presentation is we were working with a publisher. Um, Clatwell Languages uh, in the beginning, Ernst Klet Sprachen, who is of course in the room, so I have to be careful what I'm saying, just kidding. Um, um, the publisher was very, very open to, to a new book, uh, a book for the US, and there are certain advantages in terms of the customer support you are receiving, and for us to focus on just the content creation, because we're backed by, by a publisher. Um, and if you usually you look at how books are written from, from a publisher perspective, there's usually a very clear prescribed plan from the publisher, then they invite authors to execute it. But we really had a lot of freedom and independence. We were actually uh, pulled out of the normal development unit within the company and did our own thing. So that opened a lot of doors for us to do the things we wanted to do. But of course, we got some pushback as well. Um, when we pushed boundaries, the question was some of the Dexia, which we'll talk about in a second, is that really in the doodle? And also the fact that the publishing house is a publishing house that has been in business for over 125 years. And what happens if someone sees these materials in a country where what we are doing here may not be allowed? And what does that mean if you then associate those materials with that publisher who sells in that, uh, that country just other, other books, right? So that's something that has to be taken into consideration in terms of how much we can push the boundaries and also with the materials you will see here today. Um, the first category I wanna talk about is pronouns. And I see there has been some good discussion in the chat already where um, some of you interact with each other from different languages talking about pronouns. So I'm excited to, lead, uh, to read this more in depth later. Um, so we have in the book, um, we have Xia, and I will explain in a second, uh, infotext. Uh, we ask for pronouns and also we include Xia, non-binary pronoun, um, in, uh, in stories, in tasks, and with the characters that we are presenting in the book. So the first part, um, you see here an introduction of, of um, you know, the verb to study, to learn, but then we also have an info box on gender neutral pronouns, where the students uh, learn that there are several in, in, in Germany and, um, or in the German language, and the most widely used one, which is then the one that we're adopting for this book, Xia, and they get some example sentences. Um, then later on in the text, um, they got reviews on generative pronoun, but they also see uh, how they work in the accusative and the dative case as well. What we did not do at that point, and that's part of why I just explained working for a pub uh, publisher, um, we did not actually include them in every single grammar box where we had pronouns in, because at the time of publication, we were simply not allowed because that was pushing too many boundaries. But now we are, and we'll talk a little bit about how we made changes um, to the concept as well. Um, so here you see an example also highlighted in, in green uh, with C and nominative, accusative, and dative. And then we have an activity in the textbook itself. You just saw something from the, from the workbook. Um, where students talk about each other and they're trying to find out the names of people. Uh, so for example, two students sitting next to each other asking, so what's the name of this person over there? And then the student asks that person, first of all, what their name is, but also what their pronoun is. And when they then come back, they say, um, she's called or he's called or they are called based on the pronoun that they shared um, in class. And in preparation for this activity, the students learn about different options to express because they might know what you uh, pronoun they're using in English, but they don't know what they would use in German. So we explain that so that students are prepared when they do come to class to do this activity. Um, then also in character stories and tasks. So that starts with uh, simple grammar activities where you see people speak uh, and we use Xia in here as well. Uh, and also in text that, that students read, 
um, about uh, different people like here Jasper who uses C and then with Lena who uses C. So we really also use it within the book without pointing it out, without talking about pronouns here. Um, so to really integrate it um, in, into what we're doing. Um, once the first edition of the book was out, and as I said, in the first book, in Puls Deutsch 1, we only had the info boxes, but we didn't include it in every single box. In Puls Deutsch 2, at that point, we did more, and then we created interactive grammar videos, which is a series of um, six hours of instructional videos that the students can watch to learn the grammar on, at, at their own time before class. Um, here, we really included it in every single video where pronouns were present. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Let me just see. And, uh... As a gender fluid person, I use Xia as a pronoun. In our grammar tables, we will use Xia, but we mark it in gray because it represents one out of several non-binary pronouns. Nin is also common, and some people even use the English pronoun they when they speak German. Ask your instructor for more resources if you'd like to learn more about gender-neutral pronouns. Now you know the German pronouns. It's time for Miriam to explain how to add verbs. All right, let's look at heißen, which is the verb whose forms we heard on the playground. Ich heiße, du heißt. Er, es, sie, xie, heißt. Wir heißen. Ihr heißt. Sie heißen. So first of all, we included it in here. And something that you don't necessarily know, unless I tell you, is we even cast a voice actor who themselves are non-binary. So um, to really have the representation there as well. And when they spoke the scripts, we also allowed them to make changes if they saw anything that stand out to them. Um, so to, to go a step further even um, with this as well. Okay, now I have to move my mouse back to the other screen. Okay, here we are. Okay, so, and, and again, we do this in every single video where pronouns appear. And that's, again, a progress from the beginning of the book when we started and we started pushing boundaries and there was a certain pushback to realizing that we're on the right track and allowing us more and more and more to do with the book to today where we're free to, to use inclusive language everywhere. Um, and here are some, some more examples also of the different tenses um, as well. Good. So the next uh, topic would be grammatical gender. And we heard a good introduction from Lindsay about it. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about the concept itself. Uh, but we heard about masculine, neuter, and feminine nouns. We introduced also based on Lindsay's feedback, um, a der Klasse, das Klasse, and die Klasse to categorize it in a different way. Um, also call it R words, S words, and E words. And I will also give you an example of how the students are exposed to it, how they, how they learn it for the very first time. Now let's take a closer look at definite articles in German. Bestimmte Artikel. In German, each noun belongs to one of three classes. These correspond to three basic definite articles in German, der, das and die. That's right, there's more than one way of saying the. About 34% of nouns in German belong to the class of nouns that uses der as their definite article. When you learn a new noun in German, you'll also have to learn what class it belongs to. There are some patterns though. Words that end in er, like computer, are often in this class. So are words that consist of only one syllable, like stift. 20% of nouns use das as their definite article. These include many loanwords from other languages like tablet and mouse pad from English. 46% of nouns use d as their definite article. If you've got a guess, guess d. Many words that end in e, like brille, are d words. There are also other endings like ur that are often or always d. Traditionally, these classes are called noun genders masculine, neuter, and feminine. Gender comes from the Latin word genus, which just means type. Unfortunately, there's no foolproof way to predict classes based on human gender or any other feature of the noun. Obviously, nothing about a pen makes it male. And even the girl in German isn't feminine. It's neuter, das Mädchen. 
Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're just gonna have to memorize most of these. If you don't speak a language with noun classes, this all might seem strange. However, almost half of the world's languages have a system like this. If you love noun classes, you'll love the Shona language of Zimbabwe. It has 22. I like to think of the classes as the R words, S words, and the E words. This helps me remember some of the patterns we talked about, like nouns ending in E being E words. Now let's classify some nouns. Okay, and then the students get an interactive activity that appears within the video where they are practicing what they've just heard. And that's how most of our videos are structured. Now let's take a Okay, so the last uh, topic I want to cover is gendered nouns. Um, so we have the gender star um, in, in, our, in the book and throughout the book. And also we talk about the usage of it. We use it in the book, we explain it. So really from all different perspectives. And one of that is a, an info text within the workbook when the students do the first assignment where they learn about uh, all the different options. Um, but then we also have activities. So you see here, mine a partner in trägt, where they're applying it and using it. And then we went a step further in, in the, 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 the second book, uh, in Poets Deutsch 2, where we also included alternatives, inclusive language in the vocabulary list throughout for all nouns that are gendered, um, as well as a full tutorial uh, for the students with uh, 16 activities where they really learn it in depth, how, how to use it, and also what the pros and cons are about each of the alternatives. Um, so here you see an example of the vocabulary list. You see the Teilnehmer, participant male, the Teilnehmerin, participant female, and the Teilnehmer, the person, as one gender neutral alternative. And on the right side as well, the Tellerwäscher, the Tellerwäscherin, the Spülhilfe uh, as an alternative as well. And we have that for all gendered nouns. Um, across the book in Impulse Deutsch 2. And once the second edition is out, we will also do that in Impulse Deutsch 1. Um, here are some, some more examples um, from um, the glossary at the end where we do the same. So if students look up words in the glossary, they will also uh, find alternatives and sometimes even multiple. So for advisor, you, we, here again, we have uh, die Beraterin, die Berater, but we also have der, die Beraterin, um, and also the beratende person. So they get sometimes even multiple options um, for it as well across the entire glossary. And then here is the full tutorial that I just mentioned that is in the beginning of Impuls Deutsch 2. Um, first of all, the students learn what the gender star is and why it's used. And then in, this, in a follow-up activity, uh, they learn how to say it. For example, here, Lehrer in or Mechaniker in. So that they also now know not just know how to to see it and recognize it and know what it means, but also could could use it in their spoken interactions with other people. Um, then um, the students um, see examples where they see the Lehrer, the Lehrerin, and then um, the gender star version, der die Lehrerin, and they have to explain how do you get from one side to the other? How, how do you get there? How do you create it? How does it work? Right. In the next step, they have to create it. So they get their professor and the professorin, and they have to create the gender neutral version with the, the star in the middle as well. So now they're, they're applying it. In the next step, um, they learn that sometimes when you combine the two to create the gender neutral word with, with the star, that some grammatical information may be lost or some information about the nouns may be lost. You see this example here, and let me see if I can put the power, the, the pointer here there. Um, so for this one here, you see der Jude, which is the masculine version, and the Juden, which is the feminine version, becomes der die Judin. So students might not know if it's der Jude or der Jude or their youth, like they don't know if the masculine or feminine version have an umlaut or not, the two dots above the U for those who don't know. Um, so here we familiarize them with it, we make them rec make them recognize it, and they, they talk about the, the pros and cons of each of these versions and how they can infer uh, what, what each of these versions uh, may be. Um, so then um, they, they, they talk about that and, and kind of apply these rules that they've just, just learned. 
Um, and the next step is then that they're exposed to the alternatives, so not just the gender star, um, where we give them nouns, uh, and um, some of them are very clearly masculine singular, some are plural, some are gender neutral, and they have to identify that. They have to say, is it masculine? Is it feminine? Is it gender neutral? Is it singular? Or is it plural? To apply again what, what they've just learned, to see if they can recognize it and see the differences. Um, and then, as I talked about, there are pros and cons about the gender star or gender neutral nouns or total gender neutral alternatives. And the difference would be der, die, student, in, right, where you combine the masculine and the feminine version together with the gender star. Then there's die Studierenden, which would be a gender neutral noun. And the alternative would be, um, for example, for a writer, the writing person, you would say. Right, so the schreiben der Person. So these are the, th the three types of uh, of uh, alternatives, and then they have to match what is an advantage in each uh, and, and a disadvantage for each of them. Um, and then, as the final activity, they get a text where it says, "You are talking to professors who identify as female. You refer to them as, um, and so forth." Or you uh, have two uh, your fellow travelers to identify as non-binary, and one is male. You refer to them as. So to, again, to apply what they've just learned in, in context um, to, to start um, familiarizing them with it. Um, again, there's a difference between the print and the online version, because at first there was a little more pushback and then um, we, we were able to do what we wanted to do. Um, so that means in the print version, you still see, for example, for professions, that it's their mechanica, the mechanica bin, so the binary here. Uh, and as soon as as that was out, um, we and we recognized that that's well, we knew we, it wasn't good, but we were allowed to change it. Uh, we did. So now in in the online version, we we have instead of you know find the the feminine and masculine equivalents and go from one side to to the to the other side, um, we now have three categories: people who identify as a man, identify as a woman, or someone who identifies outside of the gender binary. Um, and then they have to go back and forth between uh, the three of them. And so you can see kind of the evolution um, of, of our materials as well. So now the question is, we made all of these changes uh, in the textbook. The textbook is now used by over 130 universities. So a lot of students are exposed to these materials. So we, for us, it was important that we did this, but we also wanted to know what do the students actually think about it? How do they perceive learning the language this way and how important do they think it is, but also what is their skill set? Are they able to do it now after learning it this way? Or is it very difficult for them? And uh, Lindsay is going to summarize the, the study results. Thanks, Nico. Um, so I started teaching with Impulse Deutsch myself in, um, in 2019. Um, and I was also coordinating a large, uh, a large public university's German program where we're using Impulse Deutsch uh, throughout. And when I was training our instructors in using this, they were, they were very on board. They were very interested to learn about all of the various options that we present the students as well. Often this was new to instructors, which is, which is a barrier in and of itself, right? Um, but a lot of their concerns were really rooted in what is this experience for the students? Is this something that the students want, number one? Number two, and I think most crucially, is this too much for students at the beginner level? Is this too complicated? When we're, they're already maybe learning about the concept of grammatical gender for the first time, can they handle this? Um, and, and is it effective? Um, so when I heard that uh, Nico and his colleague, um, Leanne Spinoseas, um, were collecting actual student, um, student data on this, I was really excited um, to get on board and see, see what the answers to those questions were. So Nico, if you could go to the next slide. We basically asked three sort of research questions. The first was, what ideas about language inform students' acceptance of or resistance to using gender-inclusive language? I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that when I when I show you the results. The second was, again, that question of at what point in the curriculum do students think gender and TGNC inclusive language should be introduced? Are they okay with getting it? 
immediately when it becomes grammatically relevant, or would they rather, um, as as the students in this um, in the Spanish course that we surveyed did, kind of get a really in depth introduction to this in Spanish in an upper level content course later in their language career. And then third, how confident are students with varying exposures to gender and, and TGNC inclusive language in their actual ability to use it um, if they have or haven't had um, kind of this, uh, this impulse to uh, approach to it. Nico, next slide. So we surveyed a total of 56 students. The first group we're going to refer to um, <clears throat> now on from as NC, standing for new curriculum. They were students who had gone through Impost Deutsch's new curriculum in full. They were now sixth semester German students who had been taught with everything that Nico just showed you. The second group we're going to call OC for old curriculum. These were eight semester students who had used traditional materials, who had not had that full, fully formed end product that Nico showed. We also had the Spanish group. And again, the Spanish group were in a eighth semester um, course. They were in a Spanish course entitled Language and Discrimination, um, where they were covering uh, both theoretically and practically uh, the topic of gender uh, and TGNC inclusive language. Can you go next slide, thanks. We used a mixed methodology. Um, on one hand, we were asking open-ended questions and then looking for patterns in the ways that students responded and kinds of things they said about language that showed, for example, why they might be resistant to or accepting of um, this kind of approach. We also used quantitative data. We had some Likert scale questions um, that we did descriptive statistical analysis of to understand this better. So the quantitative findings were very, very loud and clear in a way that I did not even expect. 86% of students believe that gender and TGNC inclusive language should be taught from the beginning of a language curriculum. So not just taught in general, but they are clearly okay with it happening at the beginning, um, despite kind of, kind of some of our experiences uh, um, uh, to the to the you know to that issue so that was very clear Nico next slide again when we talk about the quantitative data um, showing whether they can actually use it striking if you look at the old curriculum German zero percent of the students feeling that they could use it well and only seven percent comfortable at all right Jump to the new curriculum, you're at almost essentially 50%. Almost half of them are feeling good, comfortable, and able, and, and able to use it. And when you look at the Spanish course, again, you see something in between. So it's, it's never too late also, right? But it does seem, again, that introducing this language from the beginning, from the time that the grammar topics that are relevant come up, seems to be, um, seems to be better for the actual production of the end product. Can you go next slide? Thanks. Um, so qualitatively, we've gotten to some kind of more interesting conflicts and some kind of some kind of areas where um, where where clearly future research is needed. On one hand, again, students believed that gender and TGNC inclusive language should be taught. This is often a huge concern, again, that instructors have is that students will they'll need to explain to them what it is, and maybe they'll have a political disagreement with it, or you know, and it just doesn't seem to be the case, right? Whether or not students um, whether or not students actually want it is not an issue. But when students express any kind of resistance to it or uncertainty, or you did see on those graphs, there were students who were a lot, you know, 50% of students were still in between. I'm not totally comfortable. I'm not totally able. A lot of why they said they weren't was related in general to linguistic conservatism rather than to an objection to the idea of gender inclusivity. So very specifically, Scrolling down to that students believe that category, we saw this ideology that students felt there's a correct way to use language and there is no settled on correct way yet here. And it's not my place as a non-native speaker to enter that, right? And as a linguist, I know that that's how language change happens, right? Language change happens when societies meet, when languages meet and people share different ways of expressing things be they loan words, be it systems of thinking, be it something like gender inclusive language. And we see these conversations happening between languages, right? Between Spanish and French and French and German. We see the same kinds of strategies being employed and the conversations crossing boundaries. And so it's really important that our students 
our students, our future, our future speakers of this language, our students are becoming members of a speech community. And for them to feel that they have that agency is really important um, if we do want them to feel comfortable um, using this. Um, they also said inclusive language is challenging. So it's it's not the case, again, that the students are, are naive and think that this, this is, oh, well, this is easy, just introduce it at the beginning. They seem to understand that it's hard and they still want it. And I think that's really important. You go next slide. Give you some examples of some things that students were saying that kind of embodied these. Um, we had one uh, one student say, because the professors in the textbook used inclusive language consistently, it feels like a natural way to speak. And again, what I like about the way Impulse Deutsch does this is, you know, it's it, this is what you see in the wild, right? You see texts. Um, that are using that are using gender inclusive language. You see texts that aren't too, and students are going to see both in their journey with the language, no matter what the textbook does. And when students are seeing this on a normal basis, it becomes regularized to them. We did have students who said things like, "quote Like gender, I view language to be fluid." We had students who understood that this was a change in process, whether they saw themselves as a potential part of that or whether they thought it was valuable or possible for them to engage with it was different, but we saw that students really did see this as a, as a, as a place where language was changing um, and a place, um, a place where there was, there was kind of progress happening. But again, many students saying things like, I'm still not comfortable widely using this language because it is not widely accepted. I feel that native speakers should be the ones taking up that space. And that, you know, for those of us in the room who have had any kind of any kind of training in, in SLA pedagogy and talked at all about kind of native speakerism um, and, uh, and about the idea that our students need to understand themselves as part of the speech community, um, in order to to become part of the speech community, that's the that's the kind of thing we want to interrupt, right? Let me go next slide. Great. So, given all of this, we wanted to end by kind of sharing some best practices on one hand for teaching with gender inclusive um, and NTG and C inclusive language, um, and also some very specific resources for some of the languages that you all teach, since we've really been talking a lot about German. Next slide. So first, um, oh, is there a, is there a second thing to click, Nico? Or no, it's unfortunately a little messed up. Okay, <laughs> I think all the words are there. Um, so first, number one, introduce gender inclusive and trans affirming language early and often. This is quite clear. I even myself using Impost Deutsch, using it well myself still had reservations based on the instructors that I worked with who were really scared of doing this at the beginning. But now that I've seen what students have to say about this, I'm very convinced that it should and can be introduced early and often. And other work um, has also echoed this for, for theoretical reasons. Secondly, emphasize that gender inclusive language and trans affirming language is complex, ambiguous, in flux, uncomfortable, but that that's not anything strange. All systems of grammatical gender are that way naturally. And that's what human language is, right? So if you think um, in many languages uh, with grammatical gender, the issue of how a loan word gets assigned into a noun class is a problem, right? In German, words often come in as, as neutrum, as neuter, as das. And then because they maybe have a phonological characteristic that makes them more similar to masculine nouns, they get shuttled into that category, right? It's complicated, it's changing, it's ambiguous. There is no right or wrong answer and that's okay. And for students to understand that, like that one student understood, language is fluid like gender is really important. And finally, empowering students to see themselves as members of um, and potential agents of change in the target language speech communities is, is really important. Um, and it's for this reason that I always tell students that in addition to Zia, another really common non-binary pronoun in German is, is they, they, D-E-Y in English. It's a loan word, right? They're loaning conceptually and phonologically the material from English, and, and that's a language change in progress. Nico, slide. Here we've got um, three kind of really good um, data-driven resources uh, for the teaching of gender-inclusive language in some of the languages you guys teach. Um, the first link is, um, it's really centered around French, but there's also a lot of good answers to kind of a lot of the logistical questions instructors have, like, 
should I do a pronoun round? How do I introduce that without, you know, making students out themselves when they might not be comfortable? Kind of those, those, those structural questions about how to shape your classes, this resource is great for that. It's called Gender Just Language Education Project, um, and it's, uh, it's something being done by Dr. Chris Knisley, who is, again, in French. Um, for German, we have Impostdeutsch. <laughs> wonderfully, which you've already had a great introduction to. And that pronoun video um, is available for anyone um, online, and it can be used um, very smoothly um, with, with, any, with any curriculum. When you're introducing pronouns, you can play that video. Um, I would also say the textbook um, Grenzenlos Deutsch is an open access German textbook that also um, has a, a lot of integration of uh, gender inclusive language from the very beginning of the book. Spanish, there's a lot of resources out there for Spanish, but I'd like to particularly recommend this one. It's called the Gender and Language Project um, out, of, out of UC Berkeley. Um, and it's again, because it's very data driven, because it's being done by people who are doing research in the field. And because this one also, I should have also had a plus by it, because if you go to this one, a bunch of lesser taught languages are also covered here. They've got Chinese, I believe, um, they've got Danish. Um, and for me, uh, as someone who has taught Swedish before and just kind of likes, again, to think generally about how are these things being solved in other languages, um, I think it's like useful to look um, as an instructor of any language about at what's going on in these other languages. So that's another great resource for you. Thank you all so much um, for host, for having this today and for presenting this for us. Um, I know this is something that, like I said at the beginning, I'm very interested in as well, because I've had students who have, you know, have felt comfortable with me talking about these things, but then these are also items that I am now, you know, as a teacher wanting to make sure that I am able to use correctly, you know, not only in everyday conversation, but then also while teaching my students. So thank you all for this. And also it's been great seeing in the chat and uh, the different Q&As that have already come in through the Q&A function, um, some of the ideas of how this can, how you're already using this in your classroom, how you've possibly have seen this, maybe in your own research, in your own um, it, in your own classroom experience, but then also how this may be confusing and something that, you know, since it is something that we are all still researching, we are all still uh, looking into, it's something that we definitely need to make sure that we are keeping in the forefront of our language acquisition. So um, yeah, I guess we will get started with some of the questions. Um, I'm going to go through a few of them here just to see. Um, so a question from Julie was, has this been used with any secondary schools? I'm especially curious about any pushback from families in a public or private school system? So yes, to the question, has this been used in any secondary schools? Um, I don't know the exact uh, amount of schools on the top of my head right now, but I would estimate between five and 10 schools who are using Impulse Deutsch as a curriculum. I happen to know two of them because they have concurrent enrollment with our university. So that means the high school teacher is teaching the curriculum at the high school, but uses our curriculum. And then the students get credit for it at the high school as well as at URI where I teach. And I was the person who mentored the teacher and set up the program, which also means I went to the school and I got feedback from students. Um, so I can speak about these two schools. And in that case, it, there was no pushback whatsoever. And, and we had conversations about this beforehand where the teacher was wondering what the reaction will be. And in, in the end, uh, the students actually were the ones who are the most open about it and used to it from the English language context. And they're just part of a generation where that becomes, where there's just way more awareness this is, of course, I have to say, in, 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 in New England, so maybe in other states that might be different. I cannot speak for that. And maybe they might also be different between public or the private school system. But the two schools that I just talked about, one of them is a public school um, and the other one is, is a private school. So at least that is there as well. But again, it's um, Northeast U.S. And I don't know, Lindsay, if you have any experience with that. I don't know. I could just add a kind of a as I've started talking to teachers um, in interviews in Iowa, which is a which is a state right now that's going through a lot of politicization of, of LGBTQ plus um, 
issues in, in the K through 12 schools, you know, it's not our ideal, but what a lot of uh, teachers have kind of framed this as is this is an issue of authentic resources, right? We're representing the language um, in our in our textbooks that students will see out in the world if they go to a German university, if they if they um, are reading the news, and, and you know, and a lot of German news shows are already using the the pronounced glottal stop for the um, for the gender star, right? Um, and so this is this is if you know the students don't need to be told what gender inclusive language is or why it's important. They just need to be given the tools. I would love to also tell them about it, but really the most important thing is that you're representing that authentic spectrum of representation um, and, and giving it to them. And if that's all you're doing, it's it's really hard to come at you, right? And so that's what I would add. And very often I feel like that it's more the teacher who is skeptical in the beginning. And it's mostly not because they don't think it's important or they don't want to do it. It's just if you've taught for many, many years in a certain way and suddenly something is new that is unfamiliar, it's just something that takes a little time to adjust and get used to. Um, and usually, you know, we like to, to know everything about the things we teach and now there's something new that's different. So that is more the hold back in most cases than actually the student reaction to this. Yeah, thank you for answering those. And the, these are also experiences that I have had as well. Um, being a German teacher, I you know also follow a lot of German news sites, so um, I hear this now in that. And also, I'm starting to see the uh, the gender stanchion in a lot of newspaper articles as well as job ads. So if you ever follow any type of um, items such as job ads are looking for a new position, let's just say in a German speaking country, this is something that is becoming more popular. And um, as spoken about, it's great to have that there, at least to show. So if a student is to see that one day, they're thinking, what is this? They they already know now, no? Um, so another question, which kind of follow up to this is when I use, for example, meine Freundin, I feel that I still do not include non-binary students. What would be a solution to that? And this was from Bettina uh, Jungen. You want to take that, Lindsay? Sure, I, I can start and, and ask my, my question to you, um, <clears throat> where you might be able to add on. So there's different perspectives on the gender star um, within, within trans and non-binary communities in Germany. There are some people who feel represented by it. They feel that the star represents what is in between masculine and feminine. And there are other people who agree that it, that it doesn't, it feels like a something, you know, slotted in, <laughs> in, in the, in the middle. And, and that's what I tell my students, right? And there are, there are resources out there, um, again, that, um, that explain these kinds of things and that kind of give those different perspectives and in Postdeutsch itself, again, you talk a lot about the pros and cons, right, of every, of every solution. Is it, is it a good solution for the community? And is it an easy solution grammatically? And all of these interacting parts are very complicated. So I'm not, Nico, off the top of my head, I'm not thinking if there's a good, if there's a good um, rephrasing for Freund or Freundin, but these, these apps and these websites, again, there's more than one, but I'll put in the chat right now the one I referenced, Jen generator.app, they kind of list out every possible difference and then students can decide themselves what fits for them, right? Um, okay. I mean, you can always say the person, like the person with der ich befreundet bin, for example. Um, that's one that you can do in most cases, talking about a person who, you know, who I'm friends with, who creates art, who plays an instrument, who does things. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, and I mean, one example I could even think with that would be, ich bin eine Person, die Lehrkraft ist, no? And that's literally, I'm using a feminine or the D word there in German, the Lehrkraft, even though I'm a masculine presenting person in this role. So, you know, even in cases like that, you can even, you know, transform it that you're, you know, not using just the um, the gender star or as well right. as... Um, or, or, ich bin eine Person, die unterrichtet. I'm a person no. who teaches. Mm -hmm. And so um, making it into the verb as well. So, um, yeah. I did see a question about Anna Heger, and I think I would like to actually, because I don't know if everyone can see uh, the Q&A, so I would like to also um, 
post it in the chat so that everyone has access to that resource, which is great. We reused it. We used the version 3.3 um, of it. And I also saw another question in, in, in the chat about, you know, how did this start existing? How did it develop to become SEER? And again, it's just one option. There are many, many, many others. And um, this website uh, from Anna Hager really also shows the development from the beginning of it and what it was before and how it changed into Xia right now. And it's still developing and keeps developing, right? So I think with this, we can answer two or three questions at the same time. And I really think it's good um, to have it in a chat. And, and also we, we, keep, we keep learning, we keep improving. And, you know, we have to, of course, stay updated what's actually used within the community that we are in parts not part of. So it's it might be that in the future um, we will use they, for example, if we see that becomes more predominant in the German speaking world. And that's uh, a discussion we keep having and especially now having started working on the second edition that we have very intensively as well. Yeah, no, and thank you for answering that. And I, I do feel like this also answers a few of the questions that come in to this and um you know even looking at other languages that we could you know break go into next how or to what rules and this is coming from Ta uh karen taylor excuse me um about the other layers of language that follows on from noun gender such as adjectives so where um have you seen this progress on as well Maybe Nico can speak to German specifically, um, and I can start with a, a broader answer, which is this is where it gets complicated, right? Um, you know, Hebrew marks gender on, on verbs, <laughs> it marks gender on almost every single part of speech that you could possibly relate the noun to. So the, this is one of these places where you see varying levels of complexity um, happening in different languages and kind of different issues popping up in different languages. And so again, these resources like Genderatwad, a generator that I, um, that Klet, thank you, posted for me um, um, in the chat. And then these resources that I posted for individual languages, they all address on some level, the specific parts of speech that are relevant um, in, that, in that language, adjectives, of course, being one of them. But again, multiple complex, multifaceted solutions. Um, maybe Nico, do you want to speak to adjectives? I, I really like these, these apps and generators online. We use them extensively when we wrote the book, because again, we are not experts. A and B, there are just so many different options that are out there that we can't prescribe and say, this is the correct one and this is how you do it. So we really like to provide the students not just an alternative and a way to express themselves, but also with the skill set to find out when they don't know. You know, the, that that's, I think, the, mo the most important part, especially as this is developing and changing all the time. We don't want the students to leave our class and think Xia is the one. We want them to know it's an option out of many, and here are the resources, and here's how I can find it, and here how, is how it develops. I saw another question that I wanted to briefly touch upon, and that's, you know, whether or not it may be difficult to pronounce. And I think that is really practice. It's really practice. Uh, I don't think it's more difficult to pronounce the Sternchen than saying Streichholzstechelchen for, for the students, right? So it, I think it really is something that some of us might not be as familiar with or have not used as much in the past. So it might be perceived as something that's difficult to say. But if you learn the language starting with German or French or Spanish, or whatever, 101, you just learn it the way you learn it. And it will not be more difficult as the word I just said, right? So um, I think that difficulty level is really very much based on those who speak the language who are used to certain ways of saying things and then adjusting to different ways of doing it rather than starting from scratch and then it's not really a big deal. No, I mean, this is something that even since I started learning German many years ago, um, as a non-native speaker, it's been hard for me to even change that perspective in my own mind, because as you all were talking about earlier, you know, we were taught that language is very linear, whereas in reality, language is very fluid. And that's something that you learn, I don't think, very explicitly in college or while you're studying a language, but rather something you learn implicitly while you talk with people and you hear people speak differently than what you learned in the textbook, right? So, and these are things that we're just introducing uh, to other people. Um, and to our students. So uh, one question, this might be, and I'm 
and I hope this isn't going, uh, but how, do, excuse me, but how do we look into teaching this to a younger audience? So, you know, right now we've really looked into the idea of speaking to the maybe more mature, your uh, later high school, your college age, maybe even an adult learning the language, but how would you uh, represent this for a student who's in, a younger student who is already struggling with learning their own language and then having to learn also on top of that another language with all these new rules as well? Again, I think uh, that I, I might repeat myself, but but I don't think that there is, and this is just my my point of view and my perspective, and, and Lindsay, jump in if I'm saying something that you completely disagree with. I do not think there's a difference. I don't think there is a difference at all. There may be a difference if you, for example, look at Impulse Deutsch and the interdisciplinary approaches that we have in there and some of the critical uh, topics that we cover that are happening around the world, some of them might not be 100% the topics we would usually cover in K-12, and maybe there might be things you might need to adjust, and maybe, who knows, down the road, there will be an input Deutsch for K-12, one never knows. But, um, you know, for language and whether or not you use um, der Student oder die Studierenden or use Xie versus Z and Air, which all of those new to the students, right? And they just learn it the way you teach it to them. I do not see why that would make a difference if they're K to 12 versus college level. But again, maybe I'm naive and I don't see it, but that's just, you know, how I think about it. I yeah. agree. You know, I think the only the only real resistance is usually um, again political and 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 teacher fears surrounding that, which is why that's something we want to understand um, better. But um, I would also say that Chris Knisley's website, um, the the first one that said French, but is actually very much French plus, um, addresses this at the lower levels um, with some more practical uh, practical examples and 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 input. Because again, clearly, like Nico said, you're not going to be giving all of the extensive historical background. <laughs> information, um, but just, just in terms of, of, of making it make sense for them. Again, it's an authentic materials issue, right? And anything that you show them that is coming from a community where this is happening is, is going to evidence this, and, and they would deal with, with it the way they would any other ambiguity of language. So, There's another quick one that I can answer, not really answer, but address, and that's Tanya's question about the Goethe Institute tests and when we will see it there. Hopefully soon. I mean, there is, I mean, I know there's a lot of um, discussion going on within Goethe and a lot of their recent webinars and materials that they created were very much addressing diversity and all of the different perspectives as well. So they clearly think about that. Um, and also one of the authors of this book is actually teaching, at the, like not teaching, but um, um, working at the Goethe Institute. So there is that as well. So I think we're generally moving in that direction and good institutes do too. How yes, that yes. tests, I don't know. And I actually did attend a talk re uh, back in December from the Goods Institute in Chicago that um, had this as a topic. Um, Dr. Claire Scott, I believe her name is, or their name is, um, was there and uh, talked about it. And it was really great to, you know, have that discourse and be able to bring up these topics um, also at a more wide you know, more just looking at one textbook as an example. So, um, you know, it is becoming a, a bit more forthcoming. And thank you for actually answering that, Nico, because I was going to ask that question next. Um, so, and I guess maybe time for one or two more. Um, one that I see here that I can also understand because I have friends with whom I've used uh, this as well, and they do not quite understand it quite in their own uh, language vernacular, but how do we talk to students about the possible confusion with the gender neutral options that may cause when speaking with native speakers? Surely not all are aware or accustomed with the alternative forms yet. So, and I, like I said, I've run into this example with some of my own friends having used it, and they're like, what do you mean? I've not heard that yet. And it's kind of weird that I'm now teaching a German speaker, I guess, a new a new form of the language, no? And, and, and I may even add to that something that pushes this even further. Um, what about students who use Xeer and learn with the book and they go abroad and they think based on learning with Impulse Deutsch that is very, very inclusive and not just this and many other aspects of what we talk about, may think every person in Germany, Austria, Switzerland is as open-minded and knows about all of these topics and has an opinion on all of these topics 
and then they arrive there doing study abroad and that's not the case and I think that is something that I realized in with my own students in my in my own class where someone went abroad and was shocked when they said well I use Xia and then the peers in the class said what is that I've never heard of that before and that's something that we're thinking about right now within the team of how we create a little more awareness about the difference between certain groups that are very aware of it and current movements versus talking about everyone in the country. Like my mom would not be able to use it, for example, right? And how do we create that awareness for students? Because, you know, the students who had that experience is part of a community. If they were living in Germany, they would know how to use it and would use it because it is important to their life. But of course, not everyone does know. But that still means we need to equip the students to be able to talk about themselves, right? As they would also be being part of the same community, living in a German speaking environment. Yeah, something to really think about. And a very good question, very good question. And I would even say that this is in our own discourse with the they, them. Um, you have some even older generations and even in the current generation that will refuse to use that. They will ask first for the respected pronoun and, you know, it, it is, um, and this is actually, there was another question about this that um, we could lead into with this is from, it was from an anonymous attendee, but what about language that is spoken by subaltern people, people who do not have the power and impact that academics and researchers from the global north have when it comes to uh, setting standards and driving changes on language use? Language change doesn't happen in a power void. And then um, also, what about the linguistic community as a driving change of this? So it's kind of a loaded question with that, but kind of following up as well from what we were just discussing is, you know, where other than, you know, the German world with Anna Heger uh, really leading this discourse and also with other, um, other linguistics as well, where can we, I guess, where will we see this go forward? <laughs> Nico, feel free to follow up because this is like, this is a really important question. Um, to kind of even summarize where I think this person is coming from in Germany right now, the, 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 the agents of change are largely in academia. In the past few years, where these changes originated was in in Berlin, in um, and in in um, other major population centers, and in um, in um, trans communities of color, really is where is where they we think that they came from. It um, was was um, was Black German feminist activism. So you've got a really complicated constellation of things going on, right? Where this th some of these forms did originate in subaltern spaces, um, but the propagators of change certainly at this point are very often academic institutions, um, but increasingly also news media um, and 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 other and other institutional structures. Um, so I think it's that's an important thing, number one, for students at a university level to to understand. Um, on the other hand, um, I think it's important that that again, we, I, and again, Nico, you can speak to your, your anecdotal experience, but I've been teaching at public schools and I've been teaching largely engineers who are going to Germany on co-ops, working in factories, right? And so this, 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 this kind of discourse does not need to be explained to them. They, 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 they encounter this the second they hit the ground. Even going back to that other question, I can anecdotally say I've had lots of students who have decided the best thing for me, even though I use they in the United States, is to use he or she in Germany. However, they valued using Tia because it helped them connect with that community when they did have it, right? When they went to Berlin for a few weeks in the summer, right? They were able to connect with those communities and to kind of um, to kind of have that ability to move between spaces. And so again, I think it's it's just really important that it's that it's contextually embedded that way. Nico, I think to add to it, I think you uh, did a great job thinking about it. No. Um, yeah, thank you. And that, I mean, and these are things that we, you know, definitely have to think about. I, I actually did teach with, you know, in the stage for a, a few semesters at my community college. And one problem I did have was a bit of the pushback with the idea of, you know, openly talking about this. And my students seem to have focused just on that instead of the idea of, no, we're learning language. We just have students that 
would prefer to use this if necessary. Um, but it's also one of those that we have to think of in a social linguistic uh, perspective that they're going to see it nonetheless, um, especially in the different countries uh, with these changes happening already and with them happening going further. Um, and then seeing them within the other sub communities that we can then, you know, definitely bring to light of this happening. Um, awesome. So I think that has answered a lot of the major overlying questions from here that I'm um, seeing within the chat, within the question and answers. So I do want to thank you both again, but I guess this, are there any closing remarks, any closing answers that you would like to say today, Lindsay? Oh, or there, there, there's one thing I would like to add is, as I said in the beginning, we're always learning and we're always improving and we make mistakes and we learn from them. And this discussion is keeps going and you know what is done keeps changing so this is not like a here's the recipe and here's how you do it this is more raising an awareness in the student body that they're aware that language is changing that they're different groups that they're inclusive in the way they use the language and then also this this means for us as authors of a book that we need to keep improving the materials and we will and we'll start working on a second edition so if you happen to know the book and are teaching with the book and there's something you would like to point us out to us, how we can improve and learn, we would very much welcome that. So please keep the conversation going. Echo all of that and uh, and really excited to see so many people here in such an active chat and a Q&A section. Thank you guys. A note at the comment on the call out contrast. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Yes, and thank you all so much. And again, my name is Tyler Johnson. I'm one of our uh, world language specialists as well as our educational specialists. If you all do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. And then I also would like to just, you know, throw in there one more time that we do have another webinar coming up that are completely free to you. Um, it is going to be about successfully embedding social and emotional learning in your language classroom. This will be on March 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And again, this goes about the, um, this is exploring the advantages and integrating SEL into your daily lessons while disco discovering a range of SEL strategies to add to your teaching repertoire throughout the school year. And then, of course, you can register with a link in the chat or anytime online at our on our website at collectwl.com. But I want to thank you all again for coming, and I will, I guess, throw it back over to Sabrina to close us out for the evening. Thank you, Tyler and Nico and Lindsay. Uh, it was a great webinar. I think we can all agree on that. And thank you all for, all for joining us. We've put the link to our next webinar in case you want to sign up straight ahead. Remember also that to get the certificate, it would be through a form. You fill that up and then we'll send it to you in about a few weeks. So yeah, that would be about it. We've also put our newsletter in case you want to sign up and a few other links. So. Remember, if you need anything, you can always send us an email to info at cletwl.com. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a nice evening.